into Holland and signed on as an unpaid officer in the army of the Prince of Orange. The Prince's Protestant army was preparing to defend the United Provinces of the Netherlands against the Catholic Spanish, who sought to retake their former colony. What the Dutch made of this aloof Catholic gentleman with no military experience, who professed to have done a bit of fencing and riding at school, is difficult to judge. At the time, Descartes spoke no Dutch, and stuck resolutely to his routine of rising at noon. Perhaps they just didn't notice him as he sat in his tent, composing a treatise on music or some such. Nowadays he would presumably be accused of being a spy, but in those days the military appear to have correctly gauged the importance of spies, and were willing to sign on any recruits, regardless of nationality, allegiance, or even willingness to participate in military routine. We do know that Descartes found himself bored by life in the army. In his view, there was too much idleness and dissipation. Does this mean there were officers who arose even later than he did? One afternoon, while strolling through the streets of Breda, Descartes noticed a poster being stuck up on a wall. In the manner of the time, it outlined an unsolved mathematical problem and challenged all comers to solve it. Descartes didn't quite understand the instructions. They were, after all, in Dutch. He turned to the Dutch gentleman standing beside him and asked if he could kindly translate. The Dutchman was unimpressed by this ignorant young French officer. He replied that he would translate the poster only if the Frenchman were willing to try to solve the problem and bring him his solution. The following afternoon, the young French officer arrived at the Dutchman's house, where to the Dutchman's surprise he found that the officer had not only solved the problem, but had done so in exceptionally brilliant fashion. According to Descartes' first biographer, Bayet, this was how Descartes met Isaac Beekman, the renowned Dutch philosopher and mathematician. The two were to remain close friends, corresponding regularly for the next two decades, with a few brief interruptions when they disagreed. I was asleep until you wakened me, Descartes was to write to Beekman. It was he who revived Descartes' interest in mathematics and philosophy, which had lain dormant since he had left La Fleche. After a year or so in the Dutch army, Descartes set off on a summer tour of Germany and the Baltic. He then decided to try another spell of army life, and journeyed to the small town of Neuburg in southern Germany, where the army of Maximilian Duke of Bavaria was camped in its winter quarters on the upper reaches of the Danube. Army life here appears to have been as strenuous as ever for Descartes, who describes how he took up residence in fine, warm quarters, persisted in his habit of sleeping ten hours a night and rising at noon, and spent his waking hours communing with my own thoughts. The political situation in Europe was now becoming serious, though it's difficult to deduce this from Descartes' attitude. The Bavarians had gone to war against Frederick V, the elector Palatinate and Protestant king of Bohemia. The entire continent was rapidly sliding into the long and disastrous conflict that came to be known as the Thirty Years' War. This war, with its ever-changing fortunes affecting countries from Sweden to Italy, was to continue until virtually the end of Descartes' life, leaving large areas of Europe, especially in Germany, devastated and deserted. Yet the effect of this war on Descartes, even when he was in the army, appears to have been minimal. Still, one can't help suspecting that this persistent background of political uncertainty, together with Descartes' own psychological uncertainties, somehow contributed to the deep internal need for certainty that was to characterize his entire philosophy. Meanwhile, the Bavarian winter set in, and soon the snow lay round about deep and crisp and even. Descartes found it so cold, he claims that he took to living in a stove, a subject of much debate. Some claim that Descartes really meant a well-heated room, others that he meant something more like a sauna, but Descartes uses the French word beul, which unquestionably means a stove. One day, while sitting in his stove, Descartes had a vision. It's not clear precisely what he saw under these rather steamed-up circumstances, but it seems that this vision contained a mathematical picture of the world. This convinced Descartes that the workings of the entire universe could be discovered by the application of some universal mathematical science. That night, 
when Descartes went to sleep he had three vivid dreams. In the first he found himself struggling against an overpowering wind, trying to make his way down the street toward the church at his old college in La Fleche. At one point he turns to greet someone, and the wind flings him against the church wall. Then, from the middle of the courtyard, someone calls to him that a friend of his has a melon which he wants to give him. In the next dream, Descartes is overcome with terror, and hears a noise like a crack of lightning, after which the darkness of his room is filled with a myriad of sparks. The last dream is less clear. In the course of this, he sees a dictionary and a book of poetry on his desk. This is followed by a number of the usual inconsequential and highly symbolic happenings that never fail to delight the dreamer and bore his listener. Descartes then decides, in his dream, to interpret these happenings. This might have given us a deep insight into Descartes' understanding of himself, but unfortunately his biographer Bayer becomes rather garbled at this point. The events of that winter day and the following night, November the 11th, 1619, would have a profound and lasting effect upon Descartes. He believed that this vision and the ensuing dreams had revealed to him his God-given vocation. They were to give him a much-needed confidence in his calling, as well as in the correctness of its findings that was not always backed by argument. But for this experience, the brilliant dilettante might never have realized his vocation. It is ironic that Descartes, the great rationalist, should have found his inspiration in a mystical vision and highly irrational dreams. This element in Descartes' thinking is often overlooked in French lycées, where the great Gallic hero and hypnophile is held up as a rationalist exemplar. Descartes' dreams have attracted a wide variety of explanation. According to the Dutch philosopher and astronomer Huygens, who was later to correspond with Descartes, these dreams were the result of Descartes' brain becoming overheated while he was in the stove. Others have suggested indigestion, overwork, lack of sleep, a mystical crisis, or the fact that he might recently have joined the Rosicrucians. The melon, whose off-stage existence is alluded to in the first dream, apparently caused much mirth to eighteenth-century readers of Descartes' biography, but with the advent of psychoanalysis this melon became a much more serious matter. As a result of his vision and the ensuing dreams, Descartes vowed that he would now dedicate his life to his intellectual studies, and would make a pilgrimage of thanksgiving to the shrine of Our Lady of Loreto in Italy so it comes as rather a surprise when we learn that instead he continued drifting aimlessly about Europe for another seven years, though he did manage to visit Loreto five years later. We have few precise details of Descartes' life during this seven-year period of vagabond life, as he called it. To begin with, he seems to have joined the Imperial Hungarian Army. But the Thirty Years' War had now begun in earnest, and gentleman officer Descartes appears to have been none too keen for active campaigning. After leaving the army, he travelled through France, Italy, Germany, Holland, Denmark, and Poland, all the time skilfully circumnavigating the regions where the war was being conducted by more dedicated members of his profession. Not that Descartes was able to avoid violence altogether. While visiting one of the Frisian islands, possibly Schiermonnikoog, he hired a boat to take him to the mainland. The sailors mistook him for a rich French merchant and planned to rob him along the way. As Descartes stood on deck, watching the low island shoreline recede across the grey sea, the sailors working the ropes jabbered among themselves in Dutch, scheming how to hit him on the head, toss him overboard, and ransack the gold which they felt sure was hidden in his trunk. But their passenger had by now picked up a smattering of Dutch during his travels, and the hapless Schiermonnik cougars found themselves confronted by a dashing Descartes brandishing his sword. They quickly backed down, promising to transport him to the mainland in safety. Sometime during this period, probably in 1623, Descartes returned home to La Haye and sold all his property. He then invested the cash in bonds, which were to provide him with a sound income for the rest of his life. One would think that during the course of this trip he might have stopped to see his family, but this is far from certain. Descartes never actually quarrelled with his family, but he remained utterly detached from them. 
despite his freedom to roam Europe at will, he didn't bother to return home for the weddings of his brother or his sister, and he did not even visit his father on his deathbed.